Professor Chess videos. Hey, I have a game out of Jeremy Silman's excellent book, How to Reassess Your Chess, 4th edition, that I am just dying to show you guys because it gives us all hope. And uh, we're all trying to improve our chess, and I am just astonished at how lousy I am <laughs> when I really look at it. But I'm enthusiastic about it, and I love to show games, and so that's bonus, I'm hoping. This game, though, is really sensational. I'm going to take it straight from his book, because there's some historic matter that I want to share with you. And I'm going to take the time to mark off each move so I don't skip a move, because this game is really incredibly super sensational. Oh, and I can see I've already set up the board wrong. Hold on, I'll be right back. Boy, you know, that's so typical of me. If I don't play lousy, I set the board up lousy. <laughs> yeah, that's welcome to the backyard, Professor Chess Videos, right? <laughs> okay, there I've got it correct. Now, I'm going to read the context for this game from Silman. It's a really awesome game. He says... Mickey Mills was a student of his in the 1970s, and he's playing the Black Pieces. And he joined a tournament that was an open tournament. Players of every rating were mixed together with it. And it happened to have a brilliancy prize. There were quite a few strong players, including the U.S. champion John Grief, and many time U.S. champion Walter Brown, so everybody expected one of the big guns, of course, to walk off with the cash bonus, right? And Mills in the tournament was not doing particularly well, and in this particular game he was paired with another Class C player, a 1500 rated player, like Mills was, right? And, of course, nobody paid much attention to their game because everyone wanted to see what the big boys were doing. And he said, After I got home with Mills, two senior masters, one was rated at 2,400, and John Grief in tow, Mickey squealed, Look at my game! Look at my game! I've played a brilliancy! And then someone says, Now, I'm not proud of this, but... I have to admit that we all burst into laughter. Okay, we said in our most sarcastic tone, please show us your brilliancy. And they're all friends here, right? So this is the game that I, that I want to show you. I'm going to take it straight from Jeremy Silman's book, How to Reassess Your Chess, 4th Edition. It's, it's a fabulous game from a regular Joe player like all of us. That's why I wanted to show you this game. It just, it's really fun. So we've got e4 and e5, knight f3, knight c6, d4, e, oh no, sorry, Hold on, let me start again. He came out with e4 and c5. Okay, just scratch the start of this. Start all over. Okay, so they start out with e4 and c5 and then knight f3. So they're playing the Sicilian and knight c6 and d4, and c took d4, which is typical in the, I believe this is the open Sicilian, and knight takes d4, and then he's going to, Mills is going to feed Keto, the bishop, and so in the meantime his opponent continues uh, strengthening his center, which is always a good thing. Bishop g7, Bishop e3, knight f6, bishop e2. So he's preparing the castle. They've both prepared the castle. Mills castles here. And his opponent puts the queen to d2. And 
So his opponent has prepared himself so that he can castle either side of the board. Mills has already done castling. Now, can you see the move that Mills played? It's a, it's a uh -huh. pretty good move at this point. He simply goes straight up the center. D5. Yeah, let's contest the center. Why not? And, and Silman says, so far we were all silent because Black is playing a, a really good opening with the Sicilian. So there's nothing much to comment on. And now his opponent goes knight takes c6. And he shows a continuation that could have worked out well for Black if e had taken d5 and then the knight had taken d5 and then the knight takes d5 and then the knight takes d4. That would have been good for Black, but he didn't. He came down here. And so Mills... Takes the pawn, or takes the knight, I should say. And Silman, of course, being an international master, he shows all kinds of analysis and variations and so on and so forth. I want to just show you this game from a typical regular Joe who played in the tournament that gives us guys hope because this is a screaming game. It is really fun. At this point, after he took with the B pawn, his opponent continued pressing, which you know, the pawn push does give him central space, yeah? And Mills put the knight there. And Silman says, yeah, that's a good move. That's not a bad move at all. And I've had, in my online games, I've had times where someone keeps pushing their pawn and hitting my knights, and I'm not quite sure where to put them. I usually end up putting them down here. But this is perfectly playable and good. And then the bishop exchanges the knight... And the bishop exchanges the bishop, right? And then we have h3. Well, black is still doing pretty good so far, Silman says in his commentary. And he comes to here. He's going to at least contact the c2 pawn on the diagonal, right? Well, his opponent plays a truly questionable move. Uh -huh. Can you see what a questionable move in this position would be? To his opponent, apparently, it was obvious that he's really going to take it to him. He's going to chase that bishop so far out of his territory that he won't ever come back. Plus, on the good side of this, this gains more kingside space for white. Yeah. And so he's forced to come to e6. And now for Silman's idea. Desperate to find something to criticize, we all became hysterical. You fool, we howled! Why did you allow him to attack your bishop with a gain of time? You know, he could, rather than just moving one down, he could have just simply come to here and stopped him, his opponent, from gaining kingside space. But it's not like Mills made any bad moves. These guys are just having fun. You know, they're rated 900 to 1100 points higher than this 1500 student, you know. So they're ribbing him in good fun and having a good time with him. And... At this point, he says, we all fell on the... F he said, Mills said, well, I was trying to egg him on. And <laughs> Silman said, you can just picture this. He said, man, we just fell on the floor and rolled on the floor laughing. It was so much fun to tease him and see what he was doing, right? However, on a serious note now, Silman says, I do want you to look at this position and tell me what's wrong with White's position. There are two items here that really should stand out to us as students of the game. What do you see? The two items are this very weak E5 pawn. That should glare out at you. That means that's a target, so you want to attack it. 
the other item is even far more important, and that is that king who has stayed in the center of the board. So, the plan for black from here on out for the rest of this game is to immediately go very fast, play very, very, very aggressively, tear open the center, and go attack that king. This board position says go attack the king. And you do everything in your power to go attack the king. You don't hold out. It doesn't matter if you have to sacrifice a rook to open it up. It doesn't matter if you have to lose the exchange and trade a rook for a bishop, or a bishop for a pawn, or whatever, or a queen for a rook. It does not matter. The idea is tear open the position and go get the king. You're not worried about material as much anymore with this kind of an attack. Okay? So let's see what happens. Queen d4. Now it looks like white has solved one of his main problems, giving support to that e5 pawn, and a tremendous power addition to the center. So, that's not bad. However, it's a blunder. It is not a good concept at all. The reason why is because white his more important objective is to castle the king, not centralize his power. There is nothing wrong with centralizing your power like that. Understand that. What's wrong is his priority. His order of moves, I'll put it that way, is incorrect. Castle first, either side, doesn't matter, and then centralize. Okay? That is what is wrong with that particular move. And F6, the next good move, and that's what Silman says. He says the reason that is a good move in this context is because he is trying to tear open the center. And it can't be wrong to do that. I understand it is the F pawn, the forget about it pawn, etc. Not in this context. In this context, the move of the F pawn is entirely good. So again, you know, we have one of those situations where you have a chess rule. Don't move the F pawn in the opening. Generally speaking, fundamentally true. In this particular instance, absolutely false. Push it and use it. That makes sense? Okay. Let's see what happens. Now, F4. Once again, I want to point out the virtue of this move. One, it really does gain valuable kingside space. Don't kid yourself. That is an important imbalance. Two, it again supports the pawn. What, what has white done? White has eliminated the weakness of e5, has he not? Okay, now that's, that's looking at it from the, from the wax on. <laughs> but now we're going to give you the wax off version of this. The wax on optimistic, yeah, we're getting it done. We've really done well to support 
The five, wax on, mama son, or papa son, or kitty son, whatever. But the wax off, the negative is, you still haven't castled. You say, well, he's ruined his castled options. On the king side, sure. But he's got that side to castle on. So, the wax off, which is worse than the wax on is, dude, you got a castle because he is making attempts to rip the center open. Now, you do not want to block this guy's pawns and interlock them. That would be a strategic error on your part. What you do want to do is you want to start exchanging pawns. You want to open the board up. The fact that he has a bishop in the center waiting to come hunting is irrelevant. You've got the bishop pair. The fact that he's trying to close it so that he can use his knight is irrelevant. You want to tear it open. You're not guessing, gee, what do I do? You know what to do. you got to go get that king. That means get rid of all this superfluous paraphernalia here in the center. Go, go, go. Get your broom out and sweep it away, baby. Yeah, it's time to do some household chores. We're going to do some sweeping of the floor right here. Yes, that is really important. This move just sucks for white. I can't put it any blunt. More blunt. And queen c7. Now this accomplishes a couple of very important things that I want to show you. And he said, of course, in good-natured fun, we ribbed Mills for not playing F takes E5, E takes E5, and then the bishop takes and winning a pawn. He said, you know, we're teasing him and playing around with him. And he completely ignores us, and he says, just keep watching. Watch what I did. This move, number one, connects his rooks, gives him another attacker of the center. You must see why that's such a good move. But there's another good reason for that move that I'll share in just a moment. After we see the next couple of moves. Well, he took f6. And the bishop takes f6, hitting the queen. Now he's making progress. Queen goes to c5. You can begin to see... Sorry, I've got the hiccups. Holy terror, Batman. Holy hiccup kebab. It should be shish kebab, but it's... Oh, it's hiccup kebab now. He is opening the center up here. This is not good for white. He goes, Bishop H4, check. The first crack in the white armor of advancing those pawns instead of castling is starting to show. The first crack in white's position, and it's not going to be pretty if you're white. King E2. Now, the move of moves. <laughs> you can't help but almost say, why is that the move of moves? Bishop c8? I mean, you know, you've got to continue blasting open the center, don't you? Wouldn't that move make more sense, etc.? This first rate move is beyond the powers of the present crop, that is, early 2010, of computers set up. The idea is, you come to here, then you go to bishop a6, check. You're getting him 
from both angles. To do that, the bishop here just is not doing anything to go get the king. Yes, it's developed. What to do? You must do better than just develop a piece and call it good. Well, he's controlling the center. You're not interested in controlling the center anymore. You're interested in attacking that king. Therefore, controlling the center is not doing what you need to do. Mills showed good, astute chess IQ by dropping this bishop down so that he could come here to bishop a6 check. And Silman says, at this point, in Mills showing us his game, he said, Michael's earlier moves had not made much of an impression on us, but when we saw this move, our pompous smiles began to fade. Let's keep watching. Now, knight takes d5. And you say, yeah, now I've got the knight, except that the pawn is pinned, the queen will be lost. So knight d5, what do you do? Do you decide, I have to attack that knight and get rid of that knight? That would be a good move, but when you find a good move, look harder and you can find a better one. The advice of a former world champion, the longest reigning world champion in chess history, Emmanuel Lasker. He was world champion for 27 years. No one's likely to ever beat that record. Mills goes ahead and goes check. Yeah. Now, his opponent comes to c4, and you ask, Okay, so what? So why was that two moves here now? One, two, and... The knight got into here, and now the pawn is pushed, supporting the knight. This pawn is still pinned, so the queen is useless. Why is that move so good when it was shut down so easily? Why is it such a big deal, you ask? Let's watch. Silman says... This move is just mind-boggling. This move is so fabulous that they're beginning to think Mills is starting to channel Alexander Alekin. That's how good that move is. Yeah? Because he's hitting B2. Straight across from the king. He's got the angle here, he's got the angle here, and now he's got the angle here, hitting the weakness of B2. This kid's playing seriously good chess. And knight will now come to B4. What would you do? I would have gotten nervous which shows me why I have to work on my game. Because I would have worried about that bishop. I would have said, oh man, now what? Let's watch what Mills did. Central thrust of his e-pawn, e5, exclamation point. Ignore the threat. 
don't freak out, don't do something silly or desperate, hit the center because that's what you want to open. Observe how through the moves, the pawn pushes, and the counter moves, how white center is dissipating. And this was what Mills started to tell these guys. The reason I made these moves is to blast open the center because the king is in the center. Let's watch. This gets really exquisite. Now the guys, Silman and the Grand Masters, are saying, does this kid make any bad moves in this game at all? That was simply fantastic. That was incredible. Knight takes a six. Okay. Well, there goes that wonderful diagonal. That's true. There goes that wonderful diagonal. E takes F4. They say, Silman says, Black learned that he's supposed to open lines in this kind of position, and he's making sure he does, but there was a more direct method called for, and that was Queen takes B2. Check. But the, the idea that this kid is playing correctly anyway is tear out the center to get to the king. And that's what he's doing. So he went a different route. Okay? The bishop comes to d4. Now white has centralized some really good power. He's got some serious diagonals toward the black king. Do you stop and address the potential threats by, say, bringing your queen over to here and begin protecting your king a little more? That's not what this kid did. He had none of it. What he did was his last undeveloped piece, the rook, he went check. Rook A to E8. He's getting every piece involved in going after that king, and it's working. Even though, from the Grandmaster perspective, and Silman goes through the variations, he did this inaccurately... For a 1500 rated player, he is kicking rump. He is doing this exquisitely well. And Silman says so. King f3 is the blunder of the game. That was exactly the wrong place to put your king. But that's where his opponent put it. So you got to work with what you have. Rook e3 check. And Silman says at this point these guys are falling out of their chairs. Not with mirth or hilarity or mocking. But they began to look around to make sure Alakin's ghost really was not there. Because they said, this is out of sight. Spectacular chess. This kid is playing just like Alakin. What a fabulous move. Yeah? For a 1500 rated player. They said this is thunder right here. Why? Because if Bishop takes the Rook then you've got a discovery, and there's no more P 
piece guarding the B2 pawn and it lets the queen come in. That's one possible problem. The bishop cannot take the rook or it stops guarding the B2 and the queen will make its way in and you have too many open files. Mills knew that. So King goes to G2 and now Mills goes pawn up F3 check and Silman is saying by now our jaws are dropping in awe of how Mills was playing this position. This was fantastic chess. King comes to f1, and at this point, rook f to e1, double the rooks, another very Alekin-ish thing he would do, and Silman says that three or four times in his analysis. From this point on, he says, wow, th th this, is, this is Grandmaster Chess style. Now the threat is check, and then mate with the next rook after the rook takes, right? So he, white's in trouble. Rook f e8 and king goes to g1. Now from here, what would you do? Check out that position for a quick second. What would you do? That's what Mills did. And Silman said, right on. Rock on because that quiet little move eliminates an escape square for the king. He is building gently without any qualm, without any fanfare or slash dash. He is building a mating net, which is how you should do it. And he said, at this point, the rook comes to f1. And the rook goes to e1. Beautiful. And now, the bishop goes to c3. And the move, in conjunction with all the other moves, that got this kid the brilliancy prize was queen takes b2. <laughs> Fabulous! Fabulous! Absolutely stunning finish. That is so Alexander Alekinish, you can't stand it, right? And it's here that White resigned. <laughs> he realized, oh man, I have been outplayed. <laughs> yeah, he got trounced. Because if the bishop does take the queen, then you take the rook. And the king will take the rook. And because you built the mating net, remember, every one of these squares are covered by the bishop and the pawn. Now you can go mate. Beautiful little game. And in fact, that's not the proper description. Let's hear what Jeremy Silman, an international master, says. Who was that masked grandmaster Larry Christensen asked me when I showed him the game some months later, this game. What is of particular interest to me is that Mills didn't offer any variations at all as he was playing through the game. Nor was he able to defend his moves with actual variations. Instead, he would explain everything he did by naming a pattern that he had learned in his chess studies. Thus, we were pelted 
by verbal nutshells of wisdom like, Central King, kill it! And he also said, ripping open the center, which he did. And maximizing the activity of my pieces, which he did. And sacrificing in order to open lines to get the king, which he did. And it's a double attack. And I'm building a mating net. Just general principles of working with the imbalances. And here's Silman's conclusion. Of course, Mills won the brilliancy prize, and none of us could do anything but applaud him. Few players of any rating ever create an evergreen game such as this one, so he can consider himself blessed. It's truly a fantastic creative effort and perhaps the greatest game by a non-master of all time. What a heap of praise properly given to a game you can now claim I have seen, thanks to the Backyard Professor, the greatest non-master game played of all time. Actually, you need to thank Jeremy Silman and his student for, for, the, for putting it in his book, but I'm helping to perpetuate that because that was fabulous. So, there is your chess video. This gives us hope. We have this kind of potential, even though we're all just lowly rated players. That's right, we are. But that doesn't mean we can't improve and play fabulous chess. So, in the meantime, remember, be good, do well, look forward to the future with enthusiasm, keep studying hard, um, enjoy it, it's a journey, it's a process. The end goal is not what we're looking for. It is to enjoy the journey of making lots of friends, having a lot of fun studying this magnificent ancient game, and improving our minds, our attitudes, our spirits, and making life better for everyone around us. Gosh, that sounds like I'm giving a sermon. Well, hey, it is Sunday, the day after the 4th of July. <laughs> so anyway, thanks, you guys. We had a fun Swiss tournament in the Backyard Professor Chess Club today. I wasn't able to join the tournament, but I did get in on it to watch it for the last uh, four rounds, and there was some spectacular chess going on. A lot of fun to watch. I'm going to start jumping into these, just so you know, and uh, come and join us in the club and get involved with these tournaments. They look like they're a lot of fun. And uh, that's the whole idea. We're having fun. We're doing well. We're improving. We're helping each other improve. We're destroying each other over the chessboard, and yet we're building each other up over the chessboard. I mean, it's the best of all worlds. So. Remember, I will see you again in the next Backyard Professor Chess video and out online in Lee Chess, the Backyard Professor Fan Chess Club. Come and join us. We're having a ball.